Uh, sorry for that, guys. We're having a lot of internet issues around the office these days, but we'll carry on and give it to you on tape. Good morning, everyone. It's Dr. Dan Lieberman. Happy Friday. I hope you had a great week and you're ready to go over your Friday questions. It's one of my favorite things we do all week. It gives me a chance to address everybody's concerns and we're going to cover a lot of ground. So without any further delay, let's dig in and see what we got. First question is from Sraven S. How can I send you my MRI? My MRI is normal, but I'm having back pain when sitting. Please help. Oh, how frustrating. Well, a quick answer is send me your MRI by going to phoenixspineandjoint.com. Go under resources, the best practice page. And on the top left of that page on the web, you see get more content like this. Submit this form and my staff will contact you and help you Upload your imaging to my secure server. In medicine, a server that handles radiology images is called a PACS, P-A-C-S. And uh, my PACS is online. It's uh, entirely secure and confidential, but then that gives me access to your images just like your, doc your real doctor or radiologist would have so that we can go over them together. There's never any charge for that. And it's really, really, really helpful. That looking at the images is, is a super critical part of the clinical process so that we can both be on the same page and really understand what's causing your problem and the disruptions in your life. Dan Scott asks, is there a limit to how many vertebrae can be done with laminectomy without fusing the spine with hardware? That is a great question, Dan Scott. This is a vertebrae of the spine, one of the bones of the vertebral bodies. This is the nerve root. This is the spinal canal with all the nerve roots in it. This is one of the nerve roots coming out. And you can see how narrowing of the foramen, the hole that the nerve root comes out, can cause a pinched nerve. And narrowing of the spinal canal can cause spinal stenosis and a pinching of all the nerves and neurogenic claudication. If we look at that on the level of the spine itself, we've got this image here. And let's switch over so we can blow this up and you guys can take a look at this. This is somebody's back from the back. And these are the little bumps you can feel along someone's back. These bones, which form the roof of the spinal canal, are called the lamina. And if you saw through these bones and remove this, that's a laminectomy. Mr. Scott was asking about the vertebral bodies. These are them. Here's L5, lumbar five, four, three, two, one. And what happens a lot of the time when someone has narrowing of the spinal canal, they have it at more than one levels. In the most extreme case in the lumbar spine, you can have it at all five levels. In the old days, some surgeons, if they did a laminectomy, if they took off the lamina and opened up or decompressed the spine, they would also recommend that the patient have a fusion where you put in hardware to lock it down. That is debunked. That's not true. It's not necessary. Laminectomy, the need for laminectomy is separate from the need for fusion. So Dan is saying, okay, well, what if I have not a one-level or a two-level or a three-level or even a four-level laminectomy? Um, is there any limit to the number I can have before I have a fusion? And my answer to that is definitely no. You can have as many level laminectomy as your surgeon recommends, and there's no automatic trigger for a fusion there. So the answer to the question is no. Let me say, though, I'm a little concerned that you're on the wrong path. My own approach to this was to say, okay, if I have this many levels of narrowing, pick the one that's the absolute worst, do the laminectomy through a minimally invasive approach at that level, 
and then see how you do. If two, three months later you're doing well, you don't need to do anything else. On the other hand, if you're still having neurogenic podication or nerve symptoms, then you can do the second level. I would rather do three 45-minute surgeries than one three-hour surgery. It's not true in every case, right? One patient, if the risk of doing the surgery is high and the surgeon wants all the anesthetic risk to be in one procedure, that might be a reason to just kind of go for it all at once. If the patient says, hey, dude, I'm not having three surgeries. I'm having one surgery or none. You know, I, I'm fine. That's patient preference. And you're the boss. You're the boss when you're having surgery. It's your body. You're the boss. So those are, there's a lot of complexities that go into it. But my own approach, honestly, Dan Scott would be a little bit different. All right. Who's next? Viper Gaming. I gotta go out on a limb and say that's not your real name, buddy, but okay, Viper Gaming. Um, I'm 16 and I feel like everything you guys show feels pretty painful to me. Can I have all three of them at the same time? My knee hurts a lot. First of all, I'm sorry you're having pain. It's um, so young, 16 is so young to be dealing with spine and joint in pain problems, pain problems of any kind. However, you know, it's your cross to bear. Everybody has to there's a lot of knees which just hurt when you're young, and you, I'm sorry to say you've got one of them. Having said that, um, please keep in mind that that pain an injection is not it's not like it's not painful. I mean, here's a, a model of the knee, and this is the knee cap, and not shown are all the muscles which go here. To do an injection in the knee, they put the needle straight through here to the space between the knee cap and the knee. So it goes right in there. Uh, it doesn't feel good. If the, if the needle bounces off the bone, that hurts. Um, but in general, it's not usually more painful than having the painful problem itself. Certainly not as painful as tearing a meniscus or an ACL tear. So it is, it is painful, but it's generally not that bad. Some people are just afraid of needles, and that's 100% legitimate. If you're afraid of needles and you really don't want to have a procedure of any kind, it's just, it's almost, it can become almost like a PTSD feeling, post-traumatic stress disorder, where it's maybe something happened to you as a child or you're just naturally sh afraid of them or whatever, then you should be sedated for the procedure. If you need sedation for a routine procedure, then you would want to go see a pain management doctor because most pain management doctors started out their training as anesthesiologists. So they're actually, they have more training in sedation than they do in spine and joint injections. And they have a lot of training in spine and joint injections. So it's really good though. In other words, if you're going to get a knee injection, for example, this is about the knee. This was a question on one of our knee videos and you're really, really afraid of needles or you're really, really shy about having the procedure, then go to a, don't have the orthopedic surgeon do it. Go to the pain management doctor and have them do it. It's uh, often better and um, uh, they definitely know how to sedate you. Um, can you have all three at once? I wouldn't recommend that. The, it's better to do things, do it, see if it works, then make a decision and escalate. So for example, if it's, having a steroid injection, and then having a, um, a, uh, a stem cell injection, either a stem, at 16, you could have a PRP injection. You're young enough that you have growth factors in your blood they could use and spin down. So steroid, then growth factor of some kind, and then um, eventually genicular block and radiofrequency ablation. No, you wouldn't try all three of them at once. You would wanna try one, see if it fails, try the next, see if it fails. Because you don't wanna take on risk that you don't have to have. Um, this question comes from Dai Pelwachi. Uh, hi, doctor. Hi, wife. Nice to meet you, at least uh, through this, this forum. Is there any way to help the body to speed up the process of digestive and absorb the herniated disc? Um, great question. So Dai uh, is talking about a herniated disc. So this is the transection of a human disc. This is the tough part, the outer part, the annulus. This is the soft part, the inner part, the nucleus. And here you can see the annulus is torn and the nucleus has herniated through and is putting pressure and irritating, turning red, this nerve root, spinal nerve root. And that's what causes sciatica, which is the symptom of the pain going down the leg. What happens in the long run is 
your body doesn't your body reacts to this nucleus because it has no blood supply so it seems like a foreign body in your body and your body's going to send in white cells that are going to chew up and absorb all of this stuff right here and what Dyf is asking is can we speed that process up um, well be careful what you ask for first because that process when it's too aggressive it causes pain the irritation of that nerve root from the reabsorption process can become exquisitely painful. And if you talk to anyone who's had sciatica, they'll tell you it's not something you want to speed up and get into. On the other hand, if there's not enough immunity, then the body doesn't heal properly. This happens in people with immune suppression or diabetes or other types of conditions. If there's not enough, then you can get a real slowdown and you don't heal and it pushes you into needing microdiscectomy surgery. So, um, A, I don't know if you really want to speed it up, uh, but I would say you don't want to be suppressed. So if you're taking the medication that suppresses your immunity, like methotrexate for arthritis or uh, uh, Embrel for a skin condition, Maybe try to bang off for a few weeks of any immunosuppressive medications. You also want to do whatever you can to be of normal good health. So that means uh, anything that's good for your immunity or your overall health, uh, eating a well-balanced diet, you know, taking good care of yourself, getting plenty of sleep, drinking lots of water, not drinking too much and not smoking, minimizing the alcohol and the tobacco. All of those things are very positive for your healing. So yeah, there are some things you can do. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, what comes up a lot, in, a question that comes up a lot in this issue, issue is, well, what about anti-inflammatory medications? Since inflammation is what's healing me, should I take those anti-inflammatories? And my answer is, when the inflammation tips over to where it's mostly causing pain, we don't want to stop it, we just want to put the brakes on it that's where an anti-inflammatory, either an epidural shot like a steroid or even oral anti-inflammatories can be a real, a real blessing. All right, let's get back to the next question. These are really good ones today. Uh, this question, I've had two surgeries on my right knee, still having pain and swelling. Gah, how frustrating. I'm so sorry that's happening. I was hospitalized with infection going into the second week after surgery. The first surgery was in 2006. The second surgery was in 2011, which ended in hospital with infection. Ah, still having pain and swelling of the right knee. Never has been without pain and swelling since the second surgery. Total mess. How frustrating, Gina Moraga. How frustrating. I'm so sorry that happened to you. The, um, there are a, a limited number of complications from knee replacement surgery, but the complications are real. And you did have the most common one, which is in fact infection. I love this graphic. It just This is from the data that came out in the registry. The American uh, Association of Orthopedic Surgeons puts out a registry of knee replacements. And there's just came out last week for the 2021 data. I plotted this. This is a, a square represents 100% of the complications everything that was observed to go wrong in the registry. The area of the, of the rectangle within the square is how much of that complication was of the total. And as you see yours, infection was actually the number one. Loosening was the second biggest one. Mechanical problem with the joint that was put in. Um, and then, uh, actually, these are a little blurry. I can barely read them. Let me get glasses. Um, instability. So even the, so much muscle was taken down that the knee is now unstable. Miscellaneous, that's a bunch of little things. Uh, Post-operative pain, wear, and fracture. I just want to point out that all of these things are um, having the best possible surgery, which I would define as using a minimally invasive surgeon who's fellowship trained, does 200 or more joints, knee replacements a year, in an outpatient setting, with spinal anesthesia and registry proven implants. So that's what I would call the best. The reason that's the best is it reduces your chances of every one of these things happening. So the reason that's the best is it reduces the chance 
of every one of these things happening, including infection. In, uh, surgical site infections are much more common in hospitals in general than they are in ambulatory surgery centers. Now, part of that is the people in ambulatory surgery centers are healthier, but a bigger part of that is just the reality of it's cleaner in a surgery center. If you get an infection, where do you go? The hospital. So you're going to go to the hospital to avoid it. You're going to where the infections are. I mean, it just, right? It doesn't make sense. So, um, and we can flip over. I'll, I'll come back to the questions in the chart in just a second. But the, um, um, the there's really no... It's also true with uh, the reason that we want minimally invasive approaches is no muscle is taken down. When you do a knee replacement, or minimal muscle is taken down, when you do a knee replacement with the femoral sparing, you can't see it in this model, but they're very careful to minimize the amount of muscle they take down to get down into the knee joint and do the replacement. And they do that minimization to reduce the postoperative pain, but there's a secondary benefit and that secondary benefit is you also have a dramatic reduction in the postoperative weakness, the amount of muscle that has to heal back, and it never heals as good as it was originally. So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into these things, but every one of these complications, the best is the best because it minimizes it. I often say in our, our publications and our scripted content and the stuff we send out that, um, goodness gracious, the you only get one chance to do it right the first time. And this, this question is, it just breaks my heart, but it's so true. The, there's really no plan B. You, you get one chance to get it right the first time. And uh, if, if you're in a revision situation with a, a joint replacement, the complication rate of that revision is substantially higher. The likelihood that you're gonna end up absolutely pain-free is substantially higher. And I mean, it's just uh, substantially worse. So really and truly, um, measure twice and cut once. You can't, what, what, I mean, it's just the statistics on this stuff are just so shocking to me. We've known for 20 years that um, the more knees a surgeon does every year, the more likely they are to avoid these complications. And yet the vast majority of people, more than 80%, go and have their knee done by a surgeon who is a low volume surgeon. We've known for years that robotic assistance is really the most important perioperative aid your surgeon can have to reduce complications, to make things faster. It's a 400% increase in their dexterity. It makes the, the human superhuman, the orthopedic surgeon becomes superhuman in his dexterity. And yet the vast majority of of uh, knee replacements in the registry are not done using a robotic assistant. I mean, people, uh, you know, you were warned. Um, you, you know, fool me twice, shame on you. I, I'm telling you right now, you can't just go to the surgeon your primary care doctor recommends or the surgeon who happened to do your injections and assume that that's the right surgeon for you that person has a very, very high probability above 90% of not being the best version of an orthopedic surgeon to do your knee. So don't hire them for the job. Get, hire the best person for the job. I mean, that's, it's crazy. But anyway, um, let's get back to the next question. All right, this one is from Cheryl Lynn. Hi, Cheryl Lynn. Had meniscus repair done but no cartilage left in the knee and have not walked right in three years. Ah, that's such a bummer because uh, a meniscus repair, you can, when you go in for surgery for a meniscus, you can have a meniscectomy or a meniscus repair. And my colleague, Dr. Phil Benyon, was explaining to me this week in an interview that we did that the meniscus repair is very attractive because you want to avoid having uh, long-term arthritis. But it's a horrible post-operative experience. You've got to go six weeks of non-weight-bearing knee in a brace, and then six weeks of physical therapy where you're minimally weight-bearing, and then six more weeks to complete the course. You're 18 weeks. That's four and a half months 
of recovery from this operation. Whereas meniscectomy, you know, it's uh, you walk out of the hospital after a 35 minute surgery and you're good to go back to work on Monday if you don't do a strenuous job. Shoot, people are back to professional sports in a couple few weeks with these things. So, I mean, you, you rolled the dice and you took a chance on the much slower recovery, the much more involved procedure and you lost. It didn't work and you continue to have pain. So I'm, Sherilyn, first of all, I'm sorry that happened, but you did bet on yourself. You said, um, I'm tired of being a guinea pig. Um, hold on a second. I've been asked to refresh the PowerPoint and I'm not sure what that means. Um, okay, let me refresh the page and see if we can get back to where we need to be. And we're gonna go to this question. Yes, and let me put that up on the screen. Okay, how's that? Are we good? All right, we're good. Okay, so here is the, um, the rest of the question. I'm tired of being a guinea pig with procedures that have not helped. Um, I, I hear the frustration I, in, in your words. So don't, I'm not, um, quite, I'm not, and you have every right to be frustrated. But guinea pig, uh, big guinea pig suggests that this was an experimental procedure. And it's not, meniscus repair is not experimental. It does often not work. It's based on the surgeon's judgment as to whether there's enough blood supply to heal the repair. And if the surgeon is wrong and there's not enough blood supply, then it doesn't work. Or if they repair it incorrectly or, or if your body just can't. So it's a partnership. They've got to do their job right and you've got to have enough intrinsic recovery capacity to, to heal it over. But so it's not ex actually experimental, Sherilyn, but it did, did not work out. And either way, it doesn't really matter. It's a bad result from your point of view, and so I'm sorry. Um, this is not living normal and trying to avoid replacement. So what is my option? I would love to be able to walk without my knee swelling every day. So first of all, um, I don't think you have the option of doing nothing. If, you if, if minimal walking every day is causing your knee to swell up, that means the articular surfaces, either between the kneecap and the leg and the thigh bone, or the joint bearing surface between the leg bone and the thigh bone, some of something in there is causing your body to shred and swell on a daily basis. From the available treatments point of view, you've basically got two options. One is to have another injection that modulates the inflammatory response. So that's either a steroid injection, which will do you good for about three days, or a stem cell-derived um, protein injection, which could last for up to a year. Because your knee is swelling quite a bit, my sense is, I'm not an expert, but my sense is that's probably not going to work. And so I feel like the tone of your letter is frustrated, and yet you want to avoid knee replacement, but to be honest, the definitive treatment in this case is knee replacement. Um, so here's our, let's go back to the chart and see, here's our typical course. Once you've had knee pain, you try rest ice, neoprene sleeve, and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. At three weeks, if that didn't work, you get x-ray. Uh, Sherilyn is long beyond this. Then you have an injection. If that doesn't work at six weeks, then you have stem cell or hyaluronic acid injection. If that doesn't work, there is one thing, and that's uh, genicular, ganglion, genicular block followed by radiofrequency ablation. So I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I, um, that might be an option for you. I tend to think of that more for arthritis and not uh, long-term meniscal damage, but it will work for that too. So you might consider genicular block and check out our video on that subject. That is a possibility. It's done by pain management doctors. You got to find one. The rando pain management doctor probably doesn't do this. You got to find one who is experienced in this technique and would be able to help you. So uh, definitely something to consider. But 
Cheryl Ann, I mean, the definitive solution to this problem is joint replacement. So I, I mean, you said it in the thing, I don't want a joint replacement, but sometimes, you know, we, we gotta, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't get the definitive time proven therapy with a 92% chance of a good or excellent long-term outcome. You can't just write that off and then say, I want the, the tried and true proven therapy, right? I mean, the tried and true proven therapy is not genicular ganglion block, although that is effective in a lot of people. But the tried and true therapy is total knee replacement. I mean, I, I think a lot of the time when people are kind of determined to avoid total knee replacement, they're, they're really thinking of kind of their mother's knee replacement. But this is a model of one of the total knee replacements. It's got three pieces. On the thigh bone, you get this cap. And today, the orthopedic surgeons use a, um, uh, the robotic uh, guide to get superhuman accuracy in the way they drill out this surface. Then there's this plastic articular surface on the inside, and then there's the implant that goes into the leg bone below. Those three parts are highly engineered and highly reliable. This operation, total knee replacement, does have a 76% um, good or excellent satisfaction rate from patients. It's more like 80% um, in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons new registry. In our practice, it's much higher than that, to be honest. All of our guys here uh, use, all of our orthopedic surgeons use robotic assistance, a minimally invasive approach on an outpatient level with registry proven implants that are never recalled, all, all of that good stuff. <clears throat> and um, in their hands, in the hands of one of these super studs, you really don't have that kind of, uh, you, you have a much better outcome. And I would strongly recommend that you think about it. I mean, you could look at genicular block and genicular radiofrequency ablation, but it's like 60% of the people get relief. And if you're ready, you know, at some point, you just may have to pull the trigger and, uh, and get the definitive therapy. Hate to be the bearer of bad news. Lola Falana. I love your name, Lola. I love your name, Lola Falana. I have cervical spinal stenosis C2 through C7, and they want to put a metal plate. I wondered if this procedure is normal. Well, that's a great question, Lola Falana. So the cervical spine is, of course, here's the skull, and we're looking down at the cervical spine. Here's C1, C2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6 and 7 are below. So Lola has narrowing stenosis from 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So in the neck, because it bends so much, there was a long-term fear that if you did multi-level laminectomy, you can get deformity. And that's really a risk because of the angle of the neck. If you take off all the structure supporting it in the back and given that big old heavy head on the top, the fear was that it would just, you would get a kyphotic deformity and it would go forward. And so a lot of surgeons, and I have to admit, I'm one of them, back in the day, I was one of them. If you were doing a multi-level laminectomy, you just put in a plate to lock those joints, force them to fuse, and prevent that deformity. I did it, so <laughs> obviously, I thought it was the right thing to do, Lola Falana. But, um, you know, guilty. It's, there's do as I say, not as I do, right? Having said that, there are people who feel there are... Uh, good intention, smart, excellent neurosurgeons who felt differently. And they would not recommend uh, putting in a plate. And it's definitely a possible, uh, it's definitely a reasonable approach. Not one I would recommend. If, if it were me, if you were my wife or my mother or my daughter, I would recommend that you have the um, plate put in. But listen to your doctor and talk it over with them. It's really important to understand your options and arrive, you're, you're a partner, you're in a partnership with your doctor. I mean, they kind of, you kind of hire them, they kind of work for you. But you, another way to think of it is you're in a partnership where they have a lot of expertise and you have a lot of expertise and you wanna come together so that you can feel good about it and um, they can feel good about it. And understand also that you're either a partner or they work for you, but you don't work for them. You don't have to do what they recommend you can ask them to do something different. If they disagree with you, they may say, you know, 
I don't think I'm the right surgeon for you. No harm, no foul. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's okay to have that discussion and to find out, find the person who matches up with the way you see it. Uh, not all, not all, everyone is different, and that applies to patients, and it also applies to surgeons. They're all different, and you want to find the one who, who has the right approach for you. All right, next question from Mr. Martin Rowland. I was told I needed to fuse L2 to L5 and straighten the spine with rods. Right now, I have bone-on-bone -bone degenerative disc and most of my discs. Options and outcome don't seem good. Oh, hit the timeout button, buddy. So uh, multi-level spinal fusion is inappropriate for degenerative disc disease. This is something that really aggressive spine surgeons did years ago. It has been shown again and again and again to be both risky and not super effective and to cause a high rate of adjacent level problems. Multi-level spinal fusion is appropriate for deformity. If you have a deformity like scoliosis and you're 15 or 16 years old or 14, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, but there's virtually never a time where multi-level spinal fusion is really appropriate for um, degenerative disc disease, as you're describing. I had a, a colleague uh, who I really looked up to who was an orthopedic spine surgeon who did uh, a lot of scoliosis deformity surgery. And I said to him once, one level fusion is amazing. Two level fusion is kind of okay. What do you do if you think a patient needs a three level fusion? And he said, for degenerative disc disease? And I said, yeah. And he said, think about it again. <laughs> like, don't, just don't do it. And so I, I, Martin Roland, I think that really good advice from my colleague, Dr. Bill Stevens, is advice that I would, I would uh, send your way as well. All right, should you have ACDF? Oh, I'm sorry, here's the question. I don't know what is ACDF. Anybody, please, thank you. And that comes from Kayloa Sherm. Hi, hi Kayloa Sherm. I'll tell you what ACDF is. It's an acronym. You know, an acronym is where the first letter of each of the words we take out and make that into a new word. The first acronym most of us encounter is SCUBA, Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. That's what SCUBA stands for. Well, A-C-D-F is an acronym as well, and it stands for anterior, which means from the front, cervical, which means neck, not lumbar, not low back, this is cervical, discectomy, we're going to take out the disc, and fusion, and then we're going to fuse it back together, usually by putting in a bone and a little plate. Anterior, cervical, discectomy, and fusion. It's really a great operation. I actually, back in the day, did literally hundred, uh, over a thousand of these things, and it's very, very effective. It really relieves the pain, and um, it's uh, a very, very usually simple operation to recover. There is a little controversy these days, and that is instead of just ACDF like they had back when I was doing that stuff, they now have ACD, um, uh, anterior cervical discectomy, with artificial disc. The artificial disc preserves range of motion in the neck as well as reducing adjacent level uh, wear and tear. And so a lot of people have the controversy, ACDF versus anterior cervical discectomy and fusion versus artificial disc. And I wrote a blog on this, which I'd recommend you go check out my website, um, Phoenix Spine and Joint, go to resources and look under neck or Google or uh, put in the search bar ACDF and you'll see this, uh, this piece that I did, which kind of looks at the two options and helps walk you individually through which one is gonna be better for you. All right, um, let us take the next question from Milton Ferratelli. Milton Ferrantelli, Ferrant Ferrantelli, Mil Milt Ferrantelli. He's got a little picture, I can barely see it, it looks like him with his, with his lady. Hello, Milt. Is knee replacement an outpatient surgery without a hospital stay? Yes, it is. Um, we, here at Phoenix Spine and Joint, we do 100% of our knee replacements as outpatient surgeries. I'm very biased. I'm a big believer that outpatient surgery is the only way to go. So much so that if you were a member of my family or someone I was advising, I would tell you 
if you're not healthy enough for outpatient surgery, you really should not be having knee replacement surgery. It's interesting, in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Registry, which came out this week, the vast majority, more than, um, I think more than 80% of knees are now being done outpatient, even if you go to the hospital. So you go to the hospital, they admit you for a while, and then they let you go, but you were never actually admitted. You were discharged to home. Anybody who can be discharged to home could have probably had that surgery uh, in an outpatient center. And so, yes, this is today an outpatient surgery. The average patient comes in, gets their knee replaced, and goes back home in six hours. So it's really just incredible. And the reason for that is the robot and the engineering and the implants and all of these things have just advanced to the point that this is now an average of a 100-minute surgery. I'm sorry, 108-minute surgery. So it's very fast. And um, it's just a, I like, I like to say, this ain't your mother's knee replacement surgery, right? This is a whole new day. And we've got really, really strong uh, options. Adrian Hall asks, told the doctor to explain to me in automotive terms. He said, my shock absorbers are blown out. Gradually came on, then got to the point that I couldn't bend it. Swollen up and terrible feeling. And he was talking about his knee. And so I would say to you that um, the, uh, he must be talking about the meniscus. So this is a cutaway of the knee. If we had somebody here, and let's go back to the full uh, view so we can show people. There we go. So if we have somebody here, we're looking at your knee from the front. Here's the side, and you can see this is the kneecap. Here's the thigh bone and the leg bones. So this is the knee. Now, if we, we're looking at the same view, but we've pulled it apart, so it's up. So let's go back to the um, image here. This is now the knee cap. Here's the thigh bone, here's the leg bones. That's the tibia and the fibula behind. This is the meniscus. See how we say it's a horseshoe shape? See, that's a meniscus toward the outside of the knee. And then this is a meniscus toward the inside of the knee. So there's two of them and they're horseshoe shaped. And you can see how this this is the joint surface of the thigh bone, and you can see how this rests on it. So it's very much like a shock absorber. Um, very, very cool analogy that your doctor gave you. I love it. All right, I am 23 years old, and as of right now, since I was, I'm 23 year old as of right now, at, since I was 15, I've always had back problems. Jeez, I'm so sorry, that's a long, you know, since 15 and you're now 23, eight years of living with back problems, a third of your life. No one believed me that my back was in such pain. Five years later, they finally saw that I was not able to move and I was hunched back and not able to stand for a minute or more. Numbness all over my lower back, shooting all the way down to my legs and ankles and feet. And it was also getting to the point where my groin was going numb. Went to a doctor and they finally saw that I was in deep trouble and had immediate surgery. Turned out that I had spinal stenosis and two herniated discs. Got surgery a few days after uh, and have been so much better ever since. I've been seeing a full time, doing full time job the last five months, and now my right side has a few huge knots and is very painful, most likely from standing at work and doing heavy lifting. What can I do? Um, so, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times people feel like spinal stenosis, you associate that with old people. But it's not true, it, either because of a large herniated disc narrowing the spinal canal. So this is the spinal canal from here to here, and the discs are the floor of the spinal canal. If your floor comes all the way up to close to the roof, you've got stenosis. Similarly, some people are born with stenosis. They, um, they have a, a congenital, congenitally, they're born with it, uh, narrow spinal canal. And if that's you, and then you throw in a little herniated disc, if your spinal canal was supposed to be two and a half centimeters thick, but you were born with one that was one centimeter thick, and then you got a disc that might not have been that big deal if you had that 25 millimeter canal, but your canal is only 10, and now you've got five, there's nothing left. So you got to get an MRI, and it sounds like that's what uh, uh, HyperCC had. 
And then the MRI showed the stenosis, surgery was done. Now, they had groin pain, numbness, weakness, neurogenic claudication or radiculopathy before the surgery. But now they're talking about back pain. When I stand, I get an ache in my back and I feel a lump in my back. It's off to one side often, feels like it's coming from your hip, burns on your outer thigh, stiff. That is from, that kind of pain is not from a herniated disc. That kind of pain is from a facet joint, a spinal facet joint. And um, facet joint pain, if you watch this series, you know, is treated with a test. You get a test block, medial branch block. And if that's effective, you go on and have radiofrequency ablation. And radiofrequency ablation is super, super successful for about six in 10 people for an average of 10 months. Six in 10 people get 80% of their pain gone for 10 months. And a lot of people say to me, that's crap. Six and 10, well, compared to what? This is a needle procedure. So, I mean, it, literally it's done through a needle. So it's not like a, a, a significant operation. It's much more like a procedure. And so it's much better than the alternative, which is not, you know, for 60% of the people having 80% pain relief. Yeah, it's not permanent, but it's the alternative, no pain relief. That is, that is uh, no pain relief. So... Uh, strongly recommend it. Anyway, you need to, um, hyper CC, you need to go back and get uh, repeat imaging. So you need a new MRI to make sure the herniated discs are resolved and there's no spinal stenosis and all that's good. But they can look on that MRI and image those facet joints. When they do the MRI for the discs, they always accidentally show the facet joints in the same cuts. And um, it's interesting that the radiologists are well-trained to comment on the MRI about the discs in the spinal canal and pushing on the nerve roots. They're much less, uh, much less compulsive about commenting on what they see in the joints. And sometimes they'll, someone will say, I have a normal MRI. Well, you don't have a normal MRI. The radiologist just didn't mention it, but you've got a huge swelling of a facet joint, and that's very often the cause of the back pain. So very important, very important thing to remember. All right, let's look at our next question. Our next question comes from Cecilia Nelson. Um, I've had steroid injections and radiofrequency ablation um, for seven years. Can't they do surgery for that? I have spondylosis and scoliosis in the lumbar, degenerative disc disease and herniated discs. Is it still possible with all that? So this is a, a blow up drawing of the lumbar spine. This is a facet joint that has arthritis. And this is a medial dorsal branch of the spinal nerve root. This is the one that goes into the discs, I'm sorry, into the facet joint. Each joint gets an innervation from the, the nerve above and the nerve below. So there's two nerves that go into this. When they do radiofrequency ablation, they put the needle right here and they're trying to buzz that nerve, but they can't see it. And so they, they do this one and they do that one by coming, getting it above, but they can't see it. And so sometimes they miss and anytime it doesn't cut the nerve, it just disables the nerve and then the nerve heals. And when the nerve heals, the pain comes back. So you have to get treated again and again and again. If you are successfully treated again and again, fine, but you have repeat RFAs. But at some point, oftentimes they just can't get it anymore. And that's when your bailout procedure is to have an endoscopic uh, ablation. In endoscopic ablation, the surgeon goes in with an endoscope, finds that little uh, nubbin of a nerve, and cuts it under direct vision. That's a newer procedure. It's often not covered by insurance. I call it direct visualized rhizotomy. Some people will call it uh, endoscopic guided dorsal radiofrequency ablation. There's a lot of different names for it. But DVR, direct visualized rhizotomy, is the one that I think is the best. Uh, and that the way you find that in your town, if you're having trouble, you can call us and we'll, we'll try to help you. But <clears throat> the way you find that in your town is by looking for a minimally invasive spine surgeon who does endoscopic discectomy. That's the person who probably knows how to do that. 
All right, Cecilia, that's the answer to your question. This one is from Sol. Hello, Dr. Amy. Oh, Sol uh, saw my colleague Amy um, Kanata. Doctor, she's a chiropractor in the practice, really used to be in the practice, really excellent doctor. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Amy can't, is not here to answer your question, but I'll do my best. Uh, my knee hurts for like a month now, but I didn't have a major accident or injury. I'm 18. I'm not a sports person. What can be the reason for it? Could it be a meniscus tear? Does it require surgery or will it heal on its own? My knee doesn't hurt when I'm walking, but it only hurts when I straighten it or bend it more than 90 degrees after keeping my leg in the same position. Please reply. Um, you know, I think the best way to answer this, uh, Sol, is to go over the normal progress of the, the doctor-recommended treatment of a knee. And that's here. So you've got knee pain. First thing is do a red flag survey. Are you in so much pain you can't walk? Is it hot? Is, are you having fevers, shakes, or chills? Do you have a history of cancer? All these things are very rare. But if you have one of them, it's important to know. Let's just, I'll assume all that's negative. The first three weeks, you want to treat yourself, treat yourself with rest, ice, a neoprene sleeve, and elevation. That's the so-called RICE. Rest, ice, <coughs> compression, C, which is a neoprene sleeve, and elevation. If you do RICE at home for three weeks and it's unsuccessful, then you see a doctor and you should get an x-ray. The purpose of the x-ray is to make sure there's not something else going on, like one of those tumors or infection or something scary, but it's a screening test. Assuming that's negative, which it almost always is, the next thing to look forward to by six weeks, if it's not better, is having an injection. If you're not better in three weeks after the injection, you can think about radiofrequency ablation. At your age, you're so young, I would not recommend it. Probably not. If you still have pain by 12 weeks, knee replacement or arthroscopic surgery. Now that is actually the recommended treatment for arthritis. In your case, you're so young, you probably don't have arthritis. You probably you could, but you could have a torn meniscus, or you could have a torn ACL. So if you get on that X-ray and you don't have, um, you get to six weeks and you're not better, that's when you should get an MRI, and that MRI is going to see what's going on in there and guide your doctor into telling you which way to go. So your specific question, Sol, uh, could it be a meniscus tear? Yes, it could. Classically, that causes locking and pops and clicks, but it's pain with straightening of the leg. Could also be a strain, which doesn't require any specific treatment. Could also be an ACL tear or a partial ACL injury. Does it require surgery or will it heal on its own? The vast majority heal on their own and do not require surgery. But you want to follow this doctor-recommended care so that you get whatever is appropriate and necessary for you. All right. Uh, Philemon Robles, is this also good for a bulge in the lumbar disc? I think Philemon had watched the um, herniated discs heal on themselves, and no, bulging discs do not heal on their own because they're not exposed to your immune system, so you just have to wait for something to happen. Natalie Steiner says, these were so helpful. Oh, thank you. We love putting out these videos to help people. Now, I'm someone who is fit, healthy, athletic, etc. I sneezed three months ago, and I'm still experiencing some annoying right-sided issues. I swear it was getting better, and then I'd cough and sneeze again, and the pain would come back. I'm starting a carpenter's apprenticeship, too. I'm pretty nervous. Ah, Natalie. Well, first of all, congratulations on the new job. And it uh, looks like you're going to be a lady carpenter, which is so cool. Um, I've treated a bunch of gals like that. And to be perfectly blunt, they're one of my favorite groups of people in the world. Just super cool, super cool uh, ladies. Anyway, let's go over the doctor-recommended care, and that starts with a red flag survey, as, as always. No fever, shakes, or chills, uh, not, no numbness or uh, weakness that's so severe that if it didn't get better on its own, you would be permanently handicapped. Uh, no history of cancer or um, unexplained weight loss, none of that stuff. So for the first three weeks, you got to treat yourself to moist heat. Um, you might try a brace. Anti-inflammatory medications are also safe. Chiropractic's been proven to help. Acupuncture's been proven to help. Modalities are better, according to our guidelines. Uh, massage, anything, these things make you comfortable, 
while you get better on your own, because thank God most people get better on their own. By three weeks, if you're not better, you should see a primary care doctor. If your symptoms are mostly radicular, which is nerve root in nature, then you're looking at a um, uh, MRI at that point. If your symptoms are mostly mechanical back, non-specific low back pain, then you should continue with, um, with the modalities. See a physical therapist if you haven't already. Now, by six weeks, you should be seeing a pain management doctor uh, if you have nerve root symptoms for an epidural injection. If you don't have nerve root symptoms, then it's time to get an MRI at this six-week point and then ha undergo radiofrequency ablation by nine weeks or microdiscectomy if you had nerve root symptoms. So there's a couple of tracks here, but that's basically how the, the time frame breaks up. You're nervous. Don't be nervous. I, I get it. Uh, at, at, who wouldn't be? Pain is scary. Uh, and uh, back and leg pain is really, it can jar, it can, it can uh, jolt you, shake you. It, you. You feel shook. Um, but it's uh, like a, a lot of those candidates on election night last week, last Tuesday, they were shook when they saw those early results coming in. Um, but what I want you to know is no matter what's wrong with you, we have really good tests to uncover it and really good treatments to make it go away. There's no, especially you seem, you seem, uh, you're young and healthy. There's every reason to believe you're going to do well. And uh, it, if you follow these doctor recommended treatment guides, you're going to have a good outcome. So hang in there. Guru Rejmi. Hi, sir. Hi, Guru. How are you? I have disc extrusion at L4-5 and L5-S1. Will exercises help me? So disc extrusion, that means you have an annulus with a tear and the soft disc has herniated out, extruded out, and is putting pressure on the nerve root. Just think about this for a minute, Guru. How would an exercise change that? So the problem is there's a tear and this thing is out. How could you exercise? You can't, right? If your problem was a joint, if a facet joint was stuck, oh, my knee's stiff, I'm going to move it. Yeah, exercise could definitely help. But your problem is a herniated disc. There's no exercise on earth for a herniated disc. And yet millions of people <laughs> watch videos every week where they are learning exercises for herniated disc. It's a sham. It's an absolute sham. Now, you don't want to you don't want to rest so much. You don't want to be inactive, right? You don't want to get blood clots in your legs. You don't want to be stiff. You don't want to So, it's okay to get be active in water. Try to get some range of motion. By all means, don't do something that's going to cause more disc herniation, right? You don't want to overdo it, but uh, guru, there's no exercise that can suck that disc in and heal that thing. That's magical thinking. I wish there was. I would definitely tell you all day to do it. But it doesn't make sense that there would be, and there isn't. And why do people keep faking and pretending? And I, I just, it's, it's not, I don't think it's, it's not right. Uh, no. Chiropractic manipulation doesn't suck that disc back in there either. I, I see people saying that all the time. It's idiotic. Look, people, the earth is not flat and discs don't suck back in. They get dissolved. There's an immune system in your body which dissolves the herniated disc, and that's how it heals. Um, I don't want to say it, but I think it's kind of ignorant <laughs> to, for, for these people to talk about sucking it back in. It's ignorant. So don't do that. You seem like a smart guy, um, smart person. I don't know what you are. So uh, do fo follow what's proven to work. Follow the science, and I think you'll be, you'll be happy that you did. Alpha Centauri, oh, what a nice name, asks. Uh, this is a long question, so I'm just going to go through it. I'm a runner, and I began experiencing substantial medial right knee pain. Medial means the inside, so I'm pain on the inside of the knee. In November of 2021, especially during bending and twisting. Mm, okay. The discomfort was transient, with some weeks worse than others, and no pain at all during the other's days or weeks. So off and on pain during the first few weeks. Worse at night when I was trying to position my leg. I had checked out an x-ray and the orthopedist gave me a call. The all clear, no arthritis. So he suggested an MRI for possible meniscus tears. But he immediately suggested surgery if there was indication of a tear. Um, so 
time out. Uh, you know, I always say it's so important to your partner with your doctor, you should listen to your doctor, except when they're wrong. <laughs> and um, someone who's having intermittent pain and is still active, first of all, doesn't need an MRI. And if the MRI showed a meniscal tear, this person sounds young and healthy, or they're, I think they're going to say later they're more my age, didn't need an MRI. And if the MRI did show a meniscal tear, you wouldn't do surgery on it at this point. So I would, I would disagree with that interpretation from that surgeon. Uh, and so did Alpha Centauri. I decided to forego the MRI and commissioned a reputable physical therapist instead while backing off running for two months. Therapy was painful because I adhered to the routines religiously. This is extremely important. Do the routines at home consistently and not just once a week in the PT's office. Fast forward to today, I'm back to running. Sub eight minute miles, good for you. With zero pain or stiffness, no more pain at night. I feel so much better now that the, my mind is no longer in rumination mode trying to solve my knee issues. I'm in the same age demographic like you and I'm, I'm 56. So presumably Alpha Centauri's in their 50s. Yeah, I mean, these uh, torn meniscus heals up on their own. And um, I do think uh, orthopedic surgeons are sometimes, um, sometimes aggressive in recommending surgery because you can see from their point of view, I do the surgery, the person got better, everybody's happy. But they don't see the people like Alpha Centauri who got better on his own and is just as well off as if he had the surgery. Keep in mind, the purpose of the surgery is not to eliminate your long-term problem. Your meniscus is still damaged when you have meniscectomy. You still are going to develop arthritis to some degree or another. There's no evidence that uh, menis meniscectomy reduces long-term arthritis that I'm aware of. So yeah, I think uh, Alpha Centauri, you did absolutely the right thing and you were smart. Well, oh my God, perfect timing. That's our, our hour is up and our questions are up. We got through all 20 of you. I really, uh, really enjoyed spending this time with you. If you have questions, then please click through to my best practice website and submit them. I would really look forward to hearing from you. I'm very excited that soon we're gonna have a video submission option. So you can leave me a short video with your question and uh, I'm looking forward to answering them. For best practice, I'm Dr. Dan Lieberman. Have a great weekend. Take good care of yourself. Everyone deserves help when they're sick or in pain. If you're in pain, ask. We're here to help. Have a good weekend. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, there are three ways to ask. Leave a comment on any of our social channels, click the link to our website and complete the submission form, or call or text us at 608-602-4022. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server. Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health. Lastly, be sure to check out new episodes at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we answer all your questions.